Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks, Ernest Tubb, for that great introduction. That's perfect. Uh, well found uh, on that 78. Because I will be talking a lot about Texas today. Um, so I hope that you can tolerate that. It's certainly one of the most American slices of America. Uh, so uh, yes, and I'll be talking about Texas a lot through the lens of this book, uh, which came out last year, which is my book, Bats of the Republic. And I'll pass that around so that everybody can take a look um, while I'm speaking about it. So yes, I come at this through book design. Um, originally a book designer, and uh, I started doing book design for my own small press called Featherproof Books in 2005 in Chicago. And I started that press with a friend of mine, Jonathan Messenger, uh, who was the editor, and I kind of functioned as the book designer. Neither of us knew anything about publishing, and I think that our lack of access to big publishing was something that made us start the small press. It was very much in the spirit of indie, DIY, um, putting out our own books, putting out our friends' books, designing them, editing them, marketing them, all of that kind of stuff. So we put out many books, and um, over the years, as I did more and more book design and got into the book design aspect, the kind of um, design that I was doing sort of infected and infused the books and the stories themselves more and more. I became very interested in what design could do as part of the story. So I'll just show you a little bit of work from Featherproof to contextualize um, how this all happened. One thing that we did are these downloadable stories called, um, well, we had mini books and then storigami, which were uh, things that you could download from our website, print out, and fold up like origami. Um, but of course, they had stories. And the stories, as you unfolded the origami, the story also unfolded. And it could be read in many different ways. So that was an early experiment um, with Featherproof. Book Universe in Miniature in Miniature um, by Patrick Somerville. Um, a collection of short stories, uh, kind of uh, some with a sci-fi bent, a futuristic bent. And um, the title story was about a father and son who who built models of a father and son building models of the universe. So it kind of was a book with this meta layer. And so I wanted to represent that in the design. And each story in the book is represented by a planet. And then the cover, you can cut out and construct a mobile of the universe, of the book, from the book itself. Um, so that was kind of the design gesture there. It also had a lot of art kind of throughout the book accompanying various stories. Another book we did in 2009, Scorch Atlas by Blake Butler. This book is a collection of post-apocalyptic short stories, kind of all set in this ruined universe. And the author told me he wanted it to kind of look like a textbook uh, that had come from this um, sort of ruined world that he was describing in his short stories. Uh, so that's how I designed the book. Um, there's a series of disasters that kind of happened throughout the book. And so um, I took physical paper and destroyed it in various ways or splattered ink on it, scanned all these pages in, and um, they provide the sort of design and backdrop for the book. For teeth, exa for example, I chewed up a piece of paper and then scanned it in. Right, so some were a lot of fun. Um, and with this book too, uh, we offered people the option of ordering a copy as it was. We printed black edges. Uh, or they could order a pre-destroyed copy, uh, which is something that we took and uh, destroyed ourselves in all sorts of ways. Let's see, I don't know if that'll play. But um, yeah, we did all sorts of things to them. I threw a box in the bathtub, put one in the barbecue in the backyard, kicked them around in the dirt, and, and then sent people these books that were half destroyed with half of the pages ripped out and stuff like that. So um, that was a lot of fun, and I, I don't normally advocate. Uh, that's the author himself actually destroying one of his books. Normally don't advocate treating books that way, but this was very fun. Um, and it led us to a contest, too. We had a contest where you could destroy your own copy of Scorch Atlas, and whoever destroyed it the best, then uh, they won the prize, which was a replacement copy. And everybody else was out of luck. 
So we had a lot of fun uh, with the kind of books that we were doing. In 2008, I did my own book on Featherproof called Boring, 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 um, which was kind of a, an experimental novel. There was a lot of design throughout. Each character had its own typeface, um, very kind of expressive art school experimentation. It's a kind of an art school satire, the book, so um, that's kind of the vibe of the whole thing. Um, here are just some pages from it. it also was designed as a series of um, large posters. If you know how books or magazines are printed, they're printed on large sheets of paper that are forms that are folded up and then bound into the covers of the book and then the edges are cut. So with this book, I designed it as a series of posters and the book itself, both. Um, so there's kind of what the posters looked like uh, and those were in an art show. And then uh, they also formed the book. Um, so I was very excited when this book came out and I thought it was really cool. Uh, so I made it very quickly, designed it very quickly, and wrote it very quickly when I was in my 20s and then I sent it out, right? We sent it to everywhere looking for book reviews. And then the book reviews came back and they said things like this. I mean, I think that one's implied in the title. This may be true. I suppose it's true of lots of things. Also hard to argue with. This is a positive review. Got. I liked that one. So what I kind of learned from this experience was that I was not very good at writing. Uh, and I kind of learned it the hard way by reading about it uh, in various print media. So in an attempt to remedy that in some way, um, I wanted to do better. I wanted to uh, write another book, maybe to erase the boring book. So I went to school at uh, School of the Art Institute in Chicago for creative writing and started to work on my writing. When I was there, I studied under Stephen Farrell, who's a book designer, a fantastic designer, and he um, came out with this book, Vess, which was very inspirational to me. Um, he worked with an author on it, um, and together they came up with this really beautiful book, which does all these great things with design. Here's just kind of an example of some of the things that he talked about in terms of what design can do when mixed with narrative. So design can be a constructing principle, right? Like how the story is designed in terms of architecture, in terms of how you get information, how information comes to you. Um, it can also be a metaphor, right? It can make narrative moves within the text, right? Create emotion, uh, create narrative moments. So uh, I started studying under him and started both writing and designing this Bats of the Republic book. Around the same time, in 2008, my grandfather died. Um, it wasn't a tragedy. He was 84, he'd lived a long life. Um, but I was thinking about him a lot because he was somebody in my family that I was very close to. And I started to think about how different his life had been from mine. He grew up on a farm in Kansas and there were no cars, there was no television. He remembers when the phone lines were put in, when the electricity was put in. So his experience of life was just radically different from mine. Um, however, we really shared something, a sense of humor and affinity for one another. I remember it, you know, in the months before he died, he <laughs> kind of had a black sense of humor. And he said he was going to the office supply store to buy paper clips. And he realized that if he just got two boxes of paper clips instead of the normal one box of paper clips, that he would have a lifetime supply of paper clips. And I thought that was hilarious. And my mom thought that was horrifying. But uh, he and I really got along. So that also kind of got me thinking about what we share with our ancestors and kind of what in us remains across different time periods, across different cultures would I recognize the thoughts and the emotions of the version of me that was walking around, say, 5,000, even 10,000 years ago? Um, they say, you know, our DNA hasn't changed 
at, at all in 10,000 years, right? I mean, apart from nutrition, say, the brain and the body that I have now was the same that my ancestor possessed 10,000 years ago. So would I even recognize that person's thoughts? Would they recognize mine? Or is that so dictated by culture and the context that we live in um, that we would be like strangers to one another? So this is what I started to think about when I was writing the book. And that led me to create two characters, one in the past named Zadok, one in the future named Zeke, uh, just a coincidence that they both look like me. And I put them in Texas. So that's another thing that we share, uh, is that we grew up in Texas. And kind of like this song says, you can take the boy out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the boy. So this is perhaps uh, the Texas in me. Um, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, which actually is the city in the American version of the bridge. I think it's the Malmo analog in the American version of the bridge, which is not as good as your version of the bridge. You may or may not know. And El Paso is nothing like this city, but it does have a bridge. Uh, the, another thing that it has is um, Carlsbad Caverns, which is in southern New Mexico, uh, some miles from El Paso. And it's this giant underground cavern, which is absolutely beautiful. If you're anywhere near it, you should absolutely go. And it houses a large colony of Mexican free-tail bats in the millions. And one thing that you can do on summer nights is go and sit outside of Carlsbad Caverns in this amphitheater, which is actually much like this theater. It's kind of a sloped uh, seating arrangement uh, in front of the cave and just watch the bats emerge uh, when the sun goes down. And it's this beautiful experience. It's very calm. It's very quiet. It's not like the movies where the bats are screeching and flying in people's hair. Um, it's actually very peaceful. It kind of sounds like a waterfall. There's kind of a very soft fluttering of wings, and they just spiral out in a big tornado above your head and fly for miles and miles uh, searching for insects. So I did this many times as a kid, um, and it was this beautiful experience. And so I started to think, what would it be like to be the first person to see this kind of thing, to stumble upon this experience. Um, so that kind of gave me my time period, which was um, uh, during the westward expansion of the United States kind of manifest destiny uh, time period. Um, and this is a really interesting period of history in the US. You know, we went from 13 colonies to occupying the entire continent in a very short period of time through various means, most of them nefarious. Um, but all sorts of new discoveries accompanied this westward expansion. Lewis and Clark uh, discovered, they were the first um, Europeans to cross all the way uh, to the other coast, and they discovered all these new species, right? They were the first to see a grizzly bear which is twice the size of any bear in Europe, you know, and just looked like a monster to them. Um, they discovered the prairie dog. You know, what a, you, guys, you know what a prairie dog is, right? Like a little gopher thing. And uh, they'd never seen one before, so the whole party of 30 or 40 stopped for an entire day trying to catch a prairie dog, which are very difficult to catch. It took 30 men. They finally caught a prairie dog, and then they sent it in a box back to the president, just to say, like, look at this weird thing that we found, right? It's a prairie dog. Uh, so lots of discoveries were happening. So uh, that's what I wanted my character to do. I wanted Zadok to go down to uh, the southwest, this kind of unexplored land. I needed to give him an excuse to go, so I gave him a love interest. Ellsworth is the sort of uh, high society woman that he would like to marry, and in order to marry her, uh, her father tells Zadok, you have to deliver a letter to a general in Texas, 900 miles away. And the letter looks like this. It says in big letters, do not open. And that physical letter, if you've seen the book, is in the back of the book, sealed. So Zadok is very tempted to open this letter to find out what kind of mission he's on, what's inside. And you as the reader at the same time, I hope, are tempted to open this letter as well, but you're not supposed to. Okay, so he sets out on this trail 
um, from Chicago, where he lives and works at a natural history museum, all the way to um, Texas, kind of following the Oregon Trail, uh, which does go through Kansas. The farm that my grandfather grew up on actually had wheel wagon ruts still running through it because the Oregon Trail passed right by uh, where he lived just a few generations ago. Another thing you'll notice about this map is uh, the Republic of Texas is large and its own country. So the book is also set during this blip of American history where Texas was its own country. And when I grew up in Texas as a kid, I had one year of Texas history and then one year of US history. One year of Texas, one year of US. So in my childhood mind, Texas and the US, about of equal import, right? And that's really kind of how Texans think of themselves. It's its, its own country in many ways. And it was for about nine years. There was a flag, a constitution, president, currency, all of the trappings of a, of a nascent republic. Um, there were many in, Tex in Texas who wanted to join uh, the United States, but John Tyler, the president at the time, would not annex Texas. It was on the sort of eve of the Civil War. I mean, I think people felt the American Civil War coming. And if they took Texas, they would have to decide if it was a free state or a slave state. And that would upset the balance of free and slave states and touch off the Civil War, which happened anyway a few years later. Um, but yes, yeah, so Texas history, this is me. This is kind of uh, the Texas in me going back and looking at all that history that I was taught as a, as a kid about Texas. Once I got outside of Texas, I realized not everybody was learning all of this history about Texas. Nobody really cared, right? This is a very Texan thing, but um, I wanted to put it in the book and I wanted to show this other Texas kind of underneath the stereotype, um, which is a very strange place, especially the desert Southwest it kind of has its own feel. Okay, so this is where I sent my character. Okay, but why is he looking for bats? So. I uh, made him and his father, uh, his father-in-law-to-be, say, uh, members of this Museum of Flying, which was kind of modeled on these early natural history museums, um, which were also a very interesting thing at that, in that uh, time period. The word scientist kind of hadn't uh, come around yet. So um, those who studied this stuff and made the discoveries and natural historians and illustrators, they were kind of almost more like showmen in a way. It was entertainment. They would go out and make discoveries and they would come back and show you amazing things and tell you stories. Um, and there was this kind of aspect of performance to it in a way. So they both work at the fictional Museum of Flying, um, which of course could include bats. So he, my character is a, a natural history illustrator, um, which gave me the excuse to start to draw uh, many things for the book, uh, many things that, that fly. So part of this is while I'm writing this story, right, I'm also creating these artifacts um, that appear in the story, that are made by the characters, that become part of the story. So these are drawings by my character of various things that fly. They were actually drawn by me in the Field Museum of Chicago, uh, which has a lot of great old taxidermy. So I would go and I would sit for many hours and I would try and draw a buffalo. And I'm not a really good draftsman. My illustration skills aren't that strong, but then I told myself, well, neither is my character. He's kind of okay. So he draws all the animals of the Southwest, the famous jackalope, which you all know comes from Texas. So you're getting a lot of his story uh, through the letters that he's writing back to his love interest. Um, and this gave me the excuse to kind of uh, practice that copper plate script. So I got the, the nib and the ink and, and started to replicate the, the way they used to write letters and um, wrote his letters back to uh, his love in Chicago. And um, as an example of what that's like and what his voice sounds like, I'm going to read you just uh, one of his letters now uh, that he writes.
Dearest Ellsworth, all is lost. I am far from the road, and several times during the nocturnal hours, when my eyes were wide and no sound broke the stillness, I imagined I heard wagons in the distance, like the uncanny creaking of ghostly ships. A hunger dream. I imagined it was a supply of provisions. The cries of the men were punctuated by the cracking of whips, the clatter of hooves and wagon wheels. The sky was lit by a full moon and a host of stars, but I only saw gray silhouettes moving in the night. Animals, riders, whole caravans that flew from my eye when I tried to view them dead on. When dawn broke and the crying of the coyote ceased, I was exhausted. I built a shelter against the sun with my blanket and some straight branches from a desert plant that has no name I know of. During the day and much of the night, I vacillated between sleep and waking, trying to rest my, my weary mind. The sun is large and vibrates heat without ceasing. There was no shade in the desert and the condition of my skin worsens. I have few eggs left. I greatly desire water, but no pool or river has appeared for many days now. I have one canteen with a ration of only a few days. How relieved my skin would be if I could wash it in cool water. It was with this purpose that I ventured forth as the sun set, and it was then that I made my first true discovery. I left the flatter land and made toward the mountains in the distance, thinking they might hide streams of runoff or secret pools. It was just as the sun set a red sliver into the mesa that I saw it. At first, I thought it was smoke. There was a single tree out in the desert, and I nervously climbed it to afford myself a better view. Up top, the wind whipping about me, I still could not discern the source of this great black cloud looming on the horizon, the size of which might indicate a wagon train or perhaps a shack completely aflame. It was rising quickly, throwing a dark mass against the sky, interwoven with gold and pink by the setting of the sun. I worked my way through the brush and the rocks slowly, fearing some marauding creature or Indian attack. The light was failing, and against the clouds gone dark, I began to worry that it was another one of my imagined silhouettes born of an overtired mind. Almost in answer to my thought, it shifted and became dark, so full of menace and purpose that it could not be anything I had dreamt. When I finally crested the hill that blocked its source, I was close enough to see the bats. I couldn't estimate the number, but it must have been hundreds upon thousands. They turned over one another and tumbled through the sky as if they were being twisted up in a tornado of their own making. Their sound was that of burbling water rushing over smooth stones. I stood still, listening to them throb against the dusk until the wind, or perhaps the bats themselves, shifted direction quite rapidly and began to stream over my uncovered head. I crouched and looked up and at once was in their great dark cloud, their wings pushing the air about me. My heart beat against the inside of my chest as though one of these wild scraps of night sky were also trapped inside me. The whole sky was blacked out. If I could have guessed how many passed by in a second, I could have figured the number in the flock, but they moved too erratically for any estimate to feel certain. Presently, their flow shifted to the east, and I crawled forward over the ledge to find myself staring into the gaping maw of a cave. It was a great crack in the face of the earth, black and wide, and the bats boiled forth without ceasing. I wouldn't have guessed one could be so large. Though it seemed a fearsome thought, what might have been hiding in the darkness of this massive hole, I had to stay. I knew that any room that could house such a great storm of bats must be the entrance to a cavern of immense size. I scraped along on my belly through the sagebrush, until I came to the edge of the cavern. Looking down into the dark, I saw there was no end in sight. The destined feeling of doom it gave me lingers still. Retreating, I quickly gathered some dead prickly pear and built a small fire just near the edge. The plants were green and about as good for fire as wet tea leaves, but I managed to ignite them. When they were all aflame, I pierced one of the fiery pads with a stalk and flung it down into the hole. I bent carefully over and watched it fall until the last flame disappeared. A few sparks finally flared against a wall of rock, a hundred yards down if I make my guess. I kicked the rest of the cactus fire toward the mouth of the cave to light things better. 
It was a great mess of flames, and it scared the bats, which for a short while stopped their ascent from the hole. When the little flames died, a few brave bats risked the flight out, and more followed, and soon they were pouring forth again. Millions there must have been. Because of the wonderment of it, there I sat for a long while. A cool air rose from the darkness of the cavern and felt miraculous against my burnt skin, a sorely needed respite from the echoless waves of desert heat. The breeze snapped me back to life. I thought on what was down below in the depths of the cave. I don't know how much time passed, but the Milky Way became bright. Again, a river of silver birds, the last fleeting glimpse of Sirius, that far star alone, seemed to wink at me. This image gave rise to a whole constellation of your visage. I saw your face, your eyes marked by two bright lamps hung in the ether in just the right spots. It seemed a beautiful and haunting farewell. Our entwined fate is a path lost to me now. I have found myself looking in a new direction, straight underground. After pulling myself up, I hiked back to the tree I had climbed and hacked off a low branch with my sword. I used the post along with my blanket to improvise a tent, and I have made my own little camp not far from the hills that hide the cavern. Tomorrow, I mean to explore its depths. Yours, Zadok. Okay, so after that, he kind of becomes obsessed with the bats and starts camping outside their cave and all sorts of things happen. All the while, he's writing letters like this one back to Ellsworth. Uh, you get her story through this sort of faux Victorian novel called The Sisters Grey, which again was a really fun thing uh, to make as an artifact. Uh, you start to hear what's happening with her and her sister and her father back in Chicago. Um, so for this, I kind of modeled the design on old Victorian novels. I got one and I, uh, uh, at one point in the story, there's a bullet hole that pierces the book, so I took a power drill and drilled a hole through the book and scanned in all the pages um, and made the artifact. In that story, Ellsworth and her sister are reading um, this book that their mother has written, which is a sci-fi book that she wrote in the 1800s. And that book is called The City State. And so then in the book, you start to read about the city state that's where we find the other protagonist, the guy 300 years in the future who also just happens to look like me. So there's kind of a, a family tree of how these two are connected. He's the distant ancestor of Zadok, the guy down there looking at the cave. And he has recently inherited a letter that looks suspiciously like the letter Zadok is carrying. It also says, do not open. So again, this guy in the future tempted to open this letter that's still in the back of the book where you have left it unopened, I think. Okay, so then for the future world, I got to do a lot of world building and I kind of borrowed a lot of dystopian motifs, the surveillance state, the kind of walled in city, and I started to visualize a lot of that stuff as well. So what the buildings looked like, Everybody's being watched um, by people who are listening in these watchtowers, they're recording all the conversations. So you get transcripts of these conversations. Some things are blacked out, right? It's a very kind of controlling government that we're familiar with from uh, sci-fi or America, wherever we've been spending time. Uh, so maps um, of the future, very fun to make. This is kind of the city-state itself. It's round, it's surrounded by a wall. Um, there's been some sort of disaster, it's post-apocalyptic, and um, humanity now has to live in these walled-in city-states. There's very few, very few people left at this time. Mm, there's all sorts of dorky stuff, like this is a steam saber. So if you were wondering how much of a dork I really am, okay, there's a steam saber in the book, so all the way. Um, and here's a map kind of showing a route out of the city-state. Zeke in the future kind of gets involved with an underground rebellion and they want to uh, escape the city-state. So that map folds out. Um, now we, we'll look at some photos of the actual book. The, um, the publisher, Doubleday, they were really great and they allowed me to do all sorts of bells and whistles 
uh, with this book. So if you're into book design, really lucked out with this um, hardcover stamped cloth on both sides uh, for the book, printed in three inks, Pantone inks. So I did a brown, a green, and a black. Even a ribbon. I, I asked for all of these things from my publisher, and I thought I'd ask for a little extra to you know, give them something to say no to, some room to negotiate. And everything I asked for, they just said yes. And the ribbon was one of those things. I thought, they'll never go for a ribbon. They're kind of expensive and, and uh, not really necessary, right? But they were like, sure, put a ribbon in there. Um, so even the end papers are uh, kind of drawings. All the bat species in Texas are represented uh, on the end on the in paper. So no part is left undesigned. And of course, there's the actual sealed envelope in the back of the book, um, which you're not supposed to open till the end, or maybe ever. The dust jacket itself, if you've seen, okay, that's reversible, so it folds out, and uh, there's sort of a table of contents of sorts. Uh, designed on the inside of the dust jacket. Okay, so this came out last October. Um, it was print. I was very happy with the book production and how it came out. They sent it out for reviews, which of course I was very nervous about after uh, boring, 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 and very anxious to see what people thought. Uh, so there's been many reviews now, but I'll show you the first review that I got. Not too bad, I that's a little step up, right? I'll take it. Okay, so I think that's all I've got to say uh, about Bats of the Republic, so thank you very much for listening and for your attention. Sure. Okay, yeah. Time for Q&A. First of all, uh, congratulations on a fantastic book. And I finished reading it last night. Well done. Did you open the letter? I did not. You didn't? I went on the website, but I don't know if that's the same thing. Ah, it should be. Yeah. So okay. I've read it. Okay, good. All right. but I, it felt like a pristine kind of thing to, to leave it intact. Ah. I was being a bit nerdy. Yes, no, yes, you're a, you're a book design purist. <laughs> exactly. So I had a few questions. You, you kind of answered a lot of them along the way. But what kind of the first that came to my mind, since you're a graphic designer first and an author second, or are you really? I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, th I think, I mean, I think of myself as a, as a designer first, I suppose. Yes, I'm much more interested in being an author, but I think it's a lot harder, at least for me. Yeah. Because it, it, when I when I looked at the book, I thought, okay, it, it's so involved, it's so intricate, and the, there's obviously all the maps, all the kind of uh, the borders, all the kind of uh, variations on on a theme of triangles and everything. I mean, no, as, as a designer myself, I know this takes a hell of a lot of time. So. What came first? Was it the story or the design? Or kind of, did I kind of join, were there kind of a parallel thoughts all the way through the process? Yes, well, maybe they were a parallel thought. I think I always wanted to do them together. I knew that the book would be designed, but I, um, I have a lot of fun designing. And knowing that I was going to design it, but I also had to write it, I made myself do the writing first. Well, that was the plan. I was going to write it first, and then as a reward, I would get to design it and do all this other stuff. That really didn't work out. I wrote a draft, and then I got distracted by all of the design stuff, and then I went back and changed a lot of things, which meant I had to change the design a lot, and then they started to kind of ping pong back and forth, and things got very messy, and then it took seven years to sort it all out. So it was not the most organized process. It's interesting because even it, it, every story ends on the, the bottom line of a page. 
And in order to do that, you, you kind of created this kind of, what I take to be a bat symbol that you kind of fill out the pages with. Or is that kind of, would you use them as pauses or would that be, because there's a lot of graphic design trickery in this in order to make this work. Sure, sure, yes, and, and it was kind of my designerly obsession to have things end perfectly at the end of the page and start at the next one. So um, that's very satisfying. When you're, not, when you're designing somebody else's text, there's always that annoying one line, right, that hangs out at the top. So I didn't have to deal with that. I just deleted some words, um, which is sometimes it's nice to be the author yeah. and the designer. Um, but I'm glad you read those little dingbats as pauses because... I think that's how I meant First, them. I read them as stitches because you, you, there's, there's, a, there's a place when, when Zeke, which is in the future, goes to his grandmother and he's, he's about to inherit a place in the Senate. Uh, and she gives him the letter. And I don't know if she, she, she's ever tells him to open it or not, but he's, he, he, she hands it over from his grandfather. And and he he knows enough to hide it from the 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 major of the state of Texas. Uh, so he sews it inside a shirt using the zigzag pattern. So I thought that it related to that pattern. But then the more I read, I realized the bats come in kind of halfway through the book. I mean, they yes. start. And and I thought it's a stylized bat, really. Yes, or it, it could be both. I I think. Both is nice. <laughs> but yes, well, the, a, a design novel, Tristram Shandy from 1759, one of the first novels, um, he had all sorts of typographical experimentation. And one of the things was um, longer dashes, longer M dashes for longer pauses. And I really liked that idea, the idea of, of creating um, pacing in that way, rather than just paragraph after paragraph having more air around certain paragraphs or a longer pause after a character says something. So um, with those little dingbats, I was able to kind of control reading pace just a little bit. It's a really interesting device, and it's the same thing as, as you, you pick three color printing. And there was another question I had. At like, it, It's like an art, artist book published by a major, a big commercial publisher. And, and how the hell did you make that happen? I got away with something. I, th I really feel like I, I got away with something there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I designed it while writing it. And when I sent it out for a submission, it was, it was completely designed. Um, and, you know, I worked on it for about a year after they, they took it. So I changed many things. But it was, it was much like what it looks like now, what was sent to the publisher. So my task there was finding a publisher that understood that got that the design was an important part. Um, so I was very lucky with Doubleday that they understood. Um, their production team is the same, uh, the same people who do a number of book groups, uh, Pantheon among them. So they've done all the big uh, graphic novels, with Chris Ware and Charles Burns. And so I think they had this understanding of the book as an object and um, special printing techniques adding to the value of something. So. I was lucky that I found somebody who understood what it could be. And saying, did you have to make any compromises, or it's just you explained that you you had a whole list wish list, and you thought if I get you know that much accepted, I'm I'm good. But they just took everything on board. Yeah, they really did. I suppose the only compromise that I really had to make was the cover which was designed by me, but designed with their designers and with their team. And um, they were happy to let me do whatever I wanted on the inside. But of course, the cover, lots of people have a vested interest in, the marketing team and the publisher and the editor, and everybody wants to get involved in the cover decision. Uh, so the cover ended up being a compromise, which was agonizing to me because as a designer, I'm an obsessive control freak and could barely let go. And, and it gave me all sorts of fits just to compromise in a friendly way. But I think I managed to. In the Is that <laughs> the reason for the, the inside cover being such an intricate design? Like it's, it's, a, it's almost like a mirror of the front cover, but it's much more complex. Or was that kind of not, so you kind of saying, well, I want one in my way, if they're gonna have the front, I'm going to have the inside. Or is that not the 
the point, really. Yeah, yeah. No, the, I think the inside cover maybe was letting off some steam, or yeah, maybe it was having my way a little bit. But um, but yeah, the cover, and, and I think I was spoiled with Featherproof. I mean, it was just my friend and I who were designing those books, so I was very used to having control over the whole design process of a book. I mean, even down to how a barcode appears. You know, I've got very specific ideas of how I want the barcodes to go. Um, so it it uh, it was difficult. I I'm making myself sound like a difficult person to work with, but maybe I am. I don't know. On the design side, on the on the story itself, I made all sorts of changes and and compromises with my editor, who you know wanted characters to do this or that, or so I I felt very flexible about the story and the writing, but then the design I got all uptight like a designer. It's interesting because basically going back to the the actual story, the book inside the book. I mean, basically you see, uh, I mean. As you described it, you say there are two main stories, and there are two main stories, but there are lots of facets to those main stories. And, and you kind of, you have this kind of sci-fi novel, which is actually written in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but, and, and you yourself is somewhere almost in the middle of this, kind of time-wise. You're not quite, maybe from your birth date, I, I haven't calculated, but somewhere bang in the middle. So you're looking equal distance uh, back and forwards. Yeah. But at the same time, the sci-fi novel is written by somebody in the past. Right, right. It kind of starts to loop around on itself a little bit. I... So I'm not, not going to give away, away the ending because it kind of picks up on that theme. But it's. Um, and I thought it was interesting because the sci-fi, and this obviously you have a great love of paper printing. And and you haven't even given up paper in uh, two thousand one hundred and forty three. Mm -hmm. There's still paper around. Yeah. How come? Well, for two reasons. One, I wanted the future to be electricity free, so a non digital future. Whatever disaster kind of destroyed everything, took out all the electricity. Um, but also. The, that future part is being written in the past. So the electricity, you know, controlling everything was not something they could conceive of. Steam, it seemed like a much more viable power source. So then I kind of, in a wink at steampunk, designed that future to be steam powered in a way. So that sort of necessitated paper, I suppose. Because they couldn't think beyond paper. Because I, I think when you see sci fi movies, I mean, they always tell more about the age they're actually created in than about the future. Exactly, yes. And and so that future world is very much modeled on the on the past. Um, especially in that book within a book, it's kind of concerned with those um, strict social codes of, of courting and getting married and, and social expectation around how that stuff is supposed to happen. Um, so I wanted a an analog in the future to those kind of rules about uh, what people are supposed to do and how society kind of controls people's lives. Was that difficult writing? Because obviously you, you, you have to pitch yourself as an author and kind of you have to use many different voices. You know, writing a kind of um, pseudo-Victorian novel is not easy because it's... Um, Sure, and, and I mean, this is my attempt at it. It's, it's hard to know if I've done that successfully or not because I know that I'm the one that's written it and I'm behind the curtain pulling all the levers. So I, I can't tell if it's a convincing 18, you know, 1800s voice or not, but I hope, I hope it is. But the feedback you got during the process, I mean, from the editors and your friends and so on, what, what, what were they saying about it? I mean, they, they seemed convinced, but then it, I can't really believe that because I think like any author, I have, you know, crippling insecurity uh, matched with just boundless ego, you know, which are kind of warring constantly within me. So it's always very easy to believe that um, uh, somehow everybody is, is lying to me about something like that. And it's terrible, really. <laughs> this is what it's like inside. The bats. Obviously, you, you talked about the Carlsbad caves. Um, is there a special interest that you have? Because at the very back of the book, you say you're going to donate 
a certain amount of money for this. Uh, it's a fungus disease that uh, affects yes. a lot of the, the bat population. And yes. Yeah, it's terrible. It's called white nose syndrome, and it, it hasn't been found in Europe yet, thankfully, um, and really only in the eastern U.S. just a few months ago. They found the first cases in the, in the western U.S., but um, sort of like more people have heard of um, colony collapse disorder with the bees, all the honeybees dying off, but not many people know that the same thing is happening to the bat population. Um, and it's terrible, the Bat Conservation International, who's the group who's working to combat this disease, the white nose syndrome, I mean, when it hits a, a cave of bats like this, I mean, the fatality rate is 99%. I mean, it just wipes them out completely, this disease. Um, and bats are really, like bees, um, ecologically very important to how the environment functions, and even with farming, they eat so many insects. You know, a bat eats many times its weight in insects a night that the amount of uh, crop pests they destroy is worth billions in insecticide. And then you don't have to put insecticide in the environment, right? So um, bats are really, really important, but because of their sort of reputation or their feel, people are creeped out by bats. They don't like them. Nobody really knows about this problem. Nobody's giving money to support this cause like people are with um, colony collapse disorder. So, um, yeah, it's really kind of a problem. I, I am very interested in bats, and, and if you are following what's happening to bats, I mean, this is, this is uh, most of the people involved think it's one of the biggest ecological disasters that's happening to the earth right now, bats. You just wouldn't think. I wasn't you know? aware of that, but it's, yeah. it's obviously... Um, but was that a, a kind of a starting point for the book? Or was that something that kind of that you came across that you in the writing process? Or? Yeah, well, more that I came across, I think the starting point was really my childhood experience of watching these bats uh, again and again. I mean, we went to that cave pretty often. El Paso is 600 miles from the nearest beach, so instead of the beach, we went to the cave. That's how it is like in the desert. Um, so I saw this again and again as a kid, and it was it was a thing that I always thought was very cool. And then I started researching bats more for this book, and you know, quickly came across this problem. It was it was just starting then. I think it started maybe two thousand six, something like that. No. So I, had a f I want to get back to your family because basically you seem to draw. It's not an autobiographical novel, but it has it hints at certain certain points because you have a family tree where you kind of put yourself in there and your future i mean your son is here and and uh, and and future generations and then how does that feel because it's it's it, it's a little bit spooky somehow they're kind of predicting your death date and yeah and so yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> I think i share my grandfather's morbid sense of humor i was gave me great delight to pick out a date um i don't know why <laughs> but uh but yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of interested in the blurry line between uh, fiction and nonfiction, which I think is a very blurry line and, and is strangely not treated as such. I think any autobiography is, uh, you know, a, a retelling in a certain light of, you know, you're selecting life events and you're telling them in a certain way with a certain purpose, usually. And any fiction, as I think any fiction author will tell you, or sometimes they're more uncomfortable with it, but it has to draw from life and your own experience and people you know and things you overheard and something you read about. So it's all sort of a combination and filtered through the author. But for some reason, we're very uncomfortable um, with the idea that this line gets crossed, you know, or, or I think fiction writers are often asked, well, is this true? And I think the answer to that is always probably kind of, right? Something of it is true or the feeling is true, but the names are changed. Or, um, And then with autobiographies like James Fry or something like that, if it turns out that somebody wrote an autobiography and parts of it aren't true, we become enraged when anybody telling their life story is going to forget, exaggerate, make things up, swap events. You know, memory is so... Uh, fallible, that how could it not be a fiction in some way? So I kind of like to play with that line a little bit, or I'm interested in that line and, and why we think it's so strict. 
Yes. It kind of brings me to my. I have one last question: is regarding your own work in relation to your teaching in in Helsinki, for example. How, how does this book come into? How can you utilize your own experience with this in your in your teaching? Well, I try not to teach my own book because I don't want to put my students through that. <laughs> But yeah, I, I learned a lot from doing it. And um, the master's program that we're just starting at Alto is in visual narrative. So it is storytelling kind of plus design or plus visuals. Um, so how narrative happens, whether it's book design or animation or even game design, it's kind of media independent. Um, and I think I, I learned a lot by doing it. And as a teacher, I think practicing what I'm talking about is, is very valuable. So even though I don't teach it because I, my students get enough of me as it is, they don't need 300 extra pages of me, I don't think. Um, but, um, but it does inform my teaching a lot and the research that I did and to other people who have done this stuff um, uh, certainly informs that teaching as well. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? We could pass this around. So just raise your hand or come over the mic. Anything about the book or teaching? Or yes. Hi, thanks for the, the lecture. And this is a totally ignorant question because I admit I haven't had a chance to read the book. Sure. Oh, I know of it. I haven't read it, but I know that's that has a heavy design element, doesn't it? It does, uh, and it it's a big part of the story in itself. So I'm, I'm curious how you feel about the balance you reached between the story and the design, and whether you ever had to sort of hold yourself in check when you were over-designing, possibly, or where that line fell for you. Sure. I, I think with that first one, I definitely over-designed, as you, as you saw in some of those reviews. So... I think I was more cognizant of the balance or, or kind of respecting the text in a different way. Um, but, but I don't know if I have a principle for it. I think it just kind of feeling your way through. I do know that I'm very interested in design or illustration that's not just illustration, right? That's not just repeating what's happening in the text or, or decorating it in some way, but is actually adding to the story is creating a narrative moment, um, taking the story further along in some way. Um, the kind of art or design that if you took it away, the story wouldn't hold together. It, wouldn't, it would stop making sense. So uh, design that's essential rather than just kind of illustrative elements. Yes, but I'd... Okay, it's working. Uh, just one question. Did you ever think about making this audiovisual or making an interactive uh, site combined yes. with it? Yes, well, um, I, th there was an audio excerpt recorded uh, by a musician who's got a great reading voice, and, and I put that clip on my site, and I, it makes me really excited about the possibility of this as an audio book, but I have no idea how that would work. Like I was just saying, so many elements are visual that I, I don't know how you would communicate them in an audio book. But the interactive thing might work. Um, and there is an ebook version of this. Oh, there's a good compromise with the publisher, the, the ebook. That was, that was interesting. It wasn't meant to be an ebook, you know, and it wasn't meant to be interactive. And um, I'm not against those kinds of books, I think there's a lot to be done in, in e-books and enhanced books and a lot of possibilities in that forum that have not really been taken advantage of. Uh, but with this, I was interested in the possibilities of the print book that haven't been taken advantage of or, or more fully explored. And I think this moment in time with design, with design software being ubiquitous and lots of people um, being able to use it, desktop publishing, printing being much cheaper. Uh, there is something in the book form that's not yet explored, or there's other things to do, I think, still in, in, printed, in printed pages. So that's what I was trying to do with this, but I'm interested in all of the other stuff, too. I think ebooks have something to do. Yeah, I don't know what, but something. I was wondering, I, th I guess the text is digital in the book, but are there any other aspects of digital design or is it all sort of handcraft? 
I would say it's all both in a very kind of graphic design way. So, you know, a lot of things were done by hand and scanned in, manipulated in Photoshop or something like that, and then taken back out and sort of back and forth, you know. Um, so yeah, I didn't really, I wasn't really strict with myself in terms of how things had to be made. I just kind of went the most efficient route, I think. But, um, and did the things that I felt like doing or that were fun to do. So like making my own stamps, right? And I could fake a stamp if I wanted to, but it was much more fun to actually make the stamp and stamp it a hundred times and pick the one that I wanted and, and stuff like that. So. Um, there are typewriter parts, and I got an old typewriter that looked like I wanted to, and typed it out, and stuff like this. So a lot of it was, you know, entertaining myself with, with some of this stuff. And then if I wanted to take a shortcut, I just did. So. Any other questions? Well. I was going to take a break <laughs> after seven years um, and look after my new son. But uh, then I started making notes for another one right away. And uh, the idea started to come, I know, and I just started to, to make that. So who knows what I've started now. Um, but I'm working on that. And um, I'm interested in also maybe making a digital something or a digital version of whatever this one is. So. Um, I'm not sure, but it's something, something to do with, uh, well, I've been reading a lot about um, um, pyramids, the Great Pyramid, um, moon bases, you know, like uh, self-contained bubble uh, moon bases, Biosphere 2, in, also in, uh, well, no, it's in uh, southern uh, Arizona. Um, and then uh, the Kalevala, which is the Finnish uh, national epic poem I've been very interested in Finnish mythology since moving to Helsinki. So uh, those are some of the things that I'm reading and are maybe the ingredients for whatever's brewing. I would say no. I would say there's a small secret history. Uh, and there are examples, but... Um, they're hard to find. They're few and few and far between. The term illuminated novel I stole from Warren Leher, who's who's done a few books like this. And this Voss that I showed is a good example. Maybe the most popular was this book, House of Leaves, um, in the mid-aughts somewhere, Mark Danielewski. And he's done a few books in this vein. He's a designer and a writer both. Um, that Tristram Shandy book is one of the oldest examples. This Book of Fish, Gould's Book of Fish, isn't that what it's called? Yes. So there are, yeah, there are some. They kind of pop up with some regularity, never very many at a time, but it feels like there's more and more. Last year, J.J. Uh, Abrams came out with one called S. He kind of hired another author, and they made this thing, and it's got all this ephemera that pops out, and... Uh, I took, I took it as a sign that J.J. Abrams had done one, that it was going to be the next big thing, and that I would soon be very rich, probably. I actually, since you mentioned the other books, there was one book I was trying to think about if there's kind of somebody working in a similar kind of vein, and I thought of Judith Shalansky's book, uh, Atlas of... Um, Islands. Yes, I yes. can't remember the, the complete title, which came Atlas of came Rupert out in Islands. Germany about five, six year, years ago, or something, which has been translated to a lot of uh, languages. And it's it's it, 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 it She's both a, an author and a graphic designer. Obviously, her the theme is very different, but it, there's some kind of um, how do you say the, 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 she's also working in in a kind of. Uh, late Victorian kind of feel to typography, even if it's a contemporary typeface, it has that feel to it, the, 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 you know, the little map references, the, the drawings and so on. Yes, I think Were it's you all aware of her book when you started? Yes, yes, Atlas of Remote Islands, yes. And I think the font is Surveyor, which is kind of that 
Hoffler Fair Jones imitation yeah. map font. But that's a beautiful yeah. book, and I love the way that it blurs fact and fiction, yeah. and the way that it uses design and maps and infographics, and printed in two colors. So there, yeah, that's true. I think. Yeah. But there, yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. book. Mini analogs there. So, yeah. So there are there are things. You know, there there. So maybe it's the kind of uh, we miss the tact tactility of things because everything's on a screen. We miss in that actually holding something, exploring something with our fingers and our eyes. Sure. Well, it does something. I think it creates meaning in some way, even if it's very soft or subtle meaning. Yeah. It adds to the experience of. Um, of a story or the way that you feel about your favorite book when you're a kid or an adult, you often start to conflate that with the physical object or the book cover or, or um, there's something there that becomes meaningful or can become very meaningful. So um, I think that that can be exploited. I mean, artist books, you know, kind of use these moves all the time. No. Yeah, uh, my question to you, what's uh, the important thing of uh, any book uh, to focus to on uh, the contain of this book or the focus to uh, on uh, design of a book or the design or contain of this book uh, can complete each other? Yes, I, thi I think the last thing, I, d I don't think that they have to be separate exactly. I, I um, It's not form versus function or form over content or content over form. I think that um, they, they enhance each other and they work best when they're both happening at once and um, kind of in a hybrid fashion. Not even, you know, they call it multimodal when you've got two modes going on, but I kind of like the thing in the middle of like one mode that contains both. And I think this sort of, um, both textual and visual literacy is actually very easy for us and easier and easier to read and to process. I think it's very natural. And uh, we're doing it more and more with the internet. Almost always we're looking at text and image at the same time and getting meaning from both. And not just text and image, but also design framework, right? There's this third element of how is the text and, and image organized in relation to each other and interactive elements, right? So if all of these things are in harmony, then I think you can create a much more um, powerful communication, whether that's a story or whether that's what other, whatever kind of communication you're trying to do. I think this kind of broadens it to the field of design or visual communication. But um, if you have all of those things working in harmony, then, then it can be very powerful, I think. When you were creating the book, what did you find was most challenging and how did you kind of solve that? Uh, definitely the writing part was the most challenging for me. Like I said, the design is funny, uh, not funny, <laughs> design is fun, sometimes it's funny, uh, and comes quite easily to me, you know, in an afternoon I can make a telegram and feel quite satisfied with how it came out, um, but the writing was just kind of endless, uh, you know, pulling of teeth, just kind of uh, never quite happy with it, it never quite right, and, and uh, I think this is just me and, and my anxiety about writing, maybe. But um, the writing was the hard part, and the design was kind of the fun part. Wow. So in relation to not just a challenge, but uh, I mean, in this way of doing the hybrid between text, visuals, and the design of it, or sometimes just the text and design, is there some, some part which you're especially happy with that you did? Something really just, this was something... Oh, um, well, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy I, with... I know my favorite in the book, that's why I'm kind of... <laughs> your favorite? Yes. Oh, well, tell me your favorite. <laughs> you tell me first if you have any ideas. Just. Well, it changes, it changes a little bit and it goes back and forth. Um, I, I really like the end papers, for example, but they were done, they were done kind of at the end or, or the most, most recently. Yeah, I was happy with those. They're all the species of bats that live in Texas, and they, um, the backgrounds, they kind of modeled on Victorian wallpaper, but the backgrounds 
uh, have something to do with each bat, kind of what insect they might eat or the environment they might sleep in or something like that. So that there, um, there was so much bat research I did for the book, learning all about, I mean, they're fascinating creatures. There's, I don't know, over a hundred different species, um, one of the most diverse mammal species, and all of the um, all of the things that they do. I mean, each species has something amazing. One has the longest like body to tongue ratio of any mammal, so that it can like like a hummingbird dip down into these beautiful flowers and get nectar. Um, and then they have hair on their on their wings, um, which are which are actually their hands, you know, and um, uh, these fine little hairs give them information about the wind direction and speed, so they're able to control their flight in in ways that birds cannot. And they're bats who can, like hummingbirds, fly backwards, and they can do all sorts of acrobatics in the air. Some will will scoop up an insect with their hand wing to like rubber band it into their mouth. I mean. They do crazy things. So anyway, I read a ton about bats. And then at some point I realized my character was in 1843 and he was just observing the bats. And even though he catches one, he really can't know anything about it in a scientific way. Even echolocation, right, was not known about. So he knows nothing about these bats and there's no way of finding that kind of stuff out for him. So then all of this stuff that I'd read, there was no way to include any of that. So the in papers are perhaps a little moment where I, I got to geek out in terms of biology. There's one thing I, I really like, which has no visuals, it's the scene where one of the main protagonists have his lover speaking to him from one ear and his best friend from the other. Maybe you can explain how that is done. Sure, sure, yes, yes. I, uh, there's two columns of text and um, you see what you see what he says and it spans both columns and then simultaneously people to the right and to the left of him are, are saying things and I did this only for a couple pages because I do think it's a, it's a chore to read and I was trying to make the book a pleasure to read uh, not a chore but um, but it was fun and it was fun to kind of try and make that work in a in a design sense just the whole material physical thing of actually seeing this through the design. I mean, you have these two people and you wonder who does he really listen to, respond to, and he says one thing and that goes, it could be replied to either one of them. And sure. it's really, really nicely done. Thank you. And this is, this is one of those things in the audiobook version, I have no idea what, <laughs> how, they, how they would do that. But, but there are things that you can only do in a book, you know, and so I think I was interested in yeah, there you go. There's the solution. Yeah. <laughs> Some other questions? Yeah. Do you have a lifetime supply of paper clips? I don't, not yet. I should get one. When I get down to two boxes, I'll know. It's a special moment. He was, he was, really, he was really funny about that. He, um, I think both his father and his grandfather and one of his cousins had all died at 84 and he was just sure that he was going to die at 84 and sure enough i mean i don't think he willed it in any way but um but there was something about that what was one of his other what was one of his oh he, he <laughs> once he got past uh, 78 or whatever the life expectancy was he started telling everyone he had a negative life expectancy which works in both senses of the word Pretty funny too. Okay. Great final comment. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Martin, especially. Thank you, Zach, for this great evening. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for having me. For your attention.